Hello, Pete. Hello. Thank you for agreeing to come on the Challenging University podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to chatting. Yeah. Um, so we met via LinkedIn, which is a way that um, most people meet nowadays, I think, unless you're active on the apps, which I am not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, so could you, for the listeners today and the listeners to come, share what your name is and what it is that you do for a job today? Sure. Um, so, yeah, my name is Pete Wallace and I am a co-founder of True North Development. So we are a training consultancy that specialises in high performance team building, high performance coaching uh, and a whole range of other bits and pieces around training development. But um, I guess what makes us quite unique is all of our products are based around Gallup Strengths, which is about understanding mm -hmm. your natural talents. Um, but more importantly, we link our work to providing free coaching to people from disadvantaged backgrounds. So um, we link. So for every five thousand pounds of revenue that we earn, we will then provide a free co strengths coaching session, which is worth about five hundred and fifty pounds, depending on who's doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. to somebody from a disadvantaged background and, and the reason we do that is because we believe that a learning and development should spread beyond an organization um, mm -hmm. but also as we'll talk about in my story I was really lucky that somebody was able to help me recognize what I was naturally talented at and really help me lean into that for success and I believe there's just so much talent out there that because of their circumstances and background just they don't get to realise it about themselves or it doesn't mm -hmm. get encouraged. Um, and ultimately, there's just so much wasted potential for people. And that was why what you did and do spoke to me when I saw, I think, a post that you'd commented on, because certainly my personal experience is that that personal development piece that I gained in corporate, which included Strengths Finder, um, was transformative. So... Let's go back in time a bit. I ask okay. everybody this question. This is where today. I lay down on the couch, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just make yourself comfortable. Explain to me a time when. Um, what was it like when you were at secondary school? What are your memories of secondary school? Yeah, so I was thinking about this. And I guess one of the things that um, struck me in one sense, it was fairly unremarkable. Um, from an academic point of view in particular, I... Like so many, the, the the show in between us really resonated because I guess <laughs> I would have been classed as an in betweener. Uh, I wasn't amazing <laughs> at sports. Um, hmm. You know, I just kind of I was a bit of a grey person, I guess, in that regard. Hmm. Um, but when I kind of think about it, what I noticed was I'm very fortunate. I'm quite a quick learner. I'm very I'm quick to take things on board. Um, and so much so during school, I was in all the top sets and. Hmm. I guess the thing that when I think about it that sort of stands out was I grew up in a um, in a housing association, which, you know, you could argue is a euphemism for a council estate. And mm -hmm. even back then, and this may have been completely internal to me, but I always felt that there was people like me uh, mm -hmm. from one side of the tracks. And then there was the people who lived in the really nice houses. And mm -hmm. I guess you could argue maybe a little bit more of a kind of middle, gra uh, middle class professional background. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the things I notice when I reflect is this element of expectation or encouragement. Mm -hmm. I was in all the top sets, but I don't ever recall being encouraged to consider something like university or, mm. um, you know, encouraged to kind of go further. I sort of turn up, I do my work, I'd go home. Yeah. Uh, so much so that even in my GCSEs, I, I did my revision in, in school time, but I didn't revise and I came away with bees. And, mm. and now what I realized that was a combination of my natural strengths. And in particular, my self-assurance, I guess, gave me that confidence. Mm. Um, but from a really early point during my sort of high school life, because we had high school where I grew up, we had sort of first middle high. Um, uh, okay. So sort of midway through high school, um, yeah. I knew I was going to join the military. Um, oh, okay. and my and my driver was that I wanted to leave Swaffham. I wanted to escape from Norfolk. Mm -hmm. and and I think a big part of that was I could see these patterns forming of mm. people who would go to school, they would then meet somebody. Normally, the 
girl was a bit younger perhaps and mm. they would look cool and you know they would stay together they would have kids and this cycle would continue mm. and you know there was also this is back in the kind of mid 90s or drugs mm. doing arounds and a few mm. of my friends went down that route and again that I didn't want to do that and the army yeah. was an escape yeah. so I guess that was a kind of big driver for me that I knew that that was my journey and where I was heading mm. um and I knew university was not an option <laughs> you know and and did um because I'm I'm interested in that army piece so where I grew up there was an army recruitment center and a lot of boys in my peer groups went joined the army and so, went straight from school um how did you know about army careers did they come into your school what, what was your um interest? I believe they did but so I guess I grew up in a family where there was a sort of large military presence if you will so uh, my okay. both my grandparents were in the uh, military my granddad was in the RAF um, mm-hmm. as a navigator um, and my other granddad worked in electronics in the RAF so ah, okay. they had that military background there my dad had done a bit in the reserves uh, and yeah. my uncle was also in the army and yeah. and he was a great help to me as well because mm. he kind of took me under his wing and really helped guide me through the recruiting process because mm. you know his concern was that I would be sort of shipped off to an area where I didn't really you know wasn't my natural skill set and actually I could mm. have got something I mean he was biased he was a, he was a tradesman and he wanted me to go for a trade basically um, <laughs> but I was I guess I was always army barmy from a young age Just yeah. loved the military I always played you know I've got loads of pictures of me as a child dressed up <laughs> um, but I think more importantly it it gave me a secure route away yeah. Yeah. and I think that's one of the things that really appealed back then you know there was a good pension yeah. to be had if you did your 22 yeah um, and it I used to fantasize like so many watching programs like Baywatch and stuff and I just used to dream of a life outside Norfolk and I knew yeah the army was my route there and ironically you could argue that university would have given the same options but it just it was closed off it no one told me I couldn't go to university but no one encouraged me Mm. but growing up with very little Mm. financially I just couldn't see a way in which a university was ever going to be an option it was just too much risk which was the comment I made that obviously how we both sort of got talking yeah um, it yeah it was just it wasn't an option and and funnily enough later on in my studies we part of the the master's program we looked at under representation of working classes in university mm. I remember I used to teach um so eventually I ended up as an education officer but I could talk about that in a bit more detail that sort of journey mm. but I, I remember asking so many of the soldiers who had backgrounds similar to mine and and I'd say to them you know what, what, what about university? You know, you're really bright. Why didn't you ever think about it? And it was always the same answer. University mm. was what the middle class kids did. You know, yeah. it, for me, it was about uh, getting a trade, getting away, mm. getting security. And it seemed to be this pattern that was repeated among so many. And could you uh, talk a little bit about um, the army or the military with education and trades because I think or certainly what I experienced you know there was a perception of certain kids going into the army and a complete misunderstanding of the education skills and all of that part that that happens when you sign up could you sort of share a bit about what that was like for you what you learned absolutely so I think one of the things I noticed certainly when I left the military so I did 21 years in the end um a lot of people think that the army is a lot of shouting, screaming, living in ditches um, mm. and, and all of that side of it, which is just very, you know, it can be further from the truth in so many areas. So for me, when I joined, I went to the careers office and you have to do an aptitude test. And yeah. basically it will then, based on your qualification from school, but also based on your just problem solving skills, and it will identify what options are available to you for the military. Mm. So um, 
I ended up becoming a marine engineer and it was mm -hmm. a technician's trade. So back when I joined, you had uh, T trade, which was technician trade. You had mm -hmm. A trade, which is like your artisan trade. So these were things like fitter mechanics, you know, bit, that sort of level. And just sorry, as an aside, because it is that word has been completely stolen by the hipsters <laughs> so it's like What's isn't that? artisan like sourdough isn't it making <laughs> yeah. a special type of coffee so let's get to the actual root of what an actual artisan trade is so you said this yeah. is a specific a, a very yeah, particular well, type of so thing. the remi in themselves if i remember right and forgive me yeah. if there's any remi guys listening i'm pretty confident that artisan as well was one of their pinnacle things that they could work towards which meant mm. they were like really the top of their trade mm. um so they probably won't, I may have even got the term wrong, but it was an A trade anyway. And then yeah. you had B trade, which was um, drivers, you know, again, so qualification level, there was, a, you know, there was a requirement to be able to do each of those different trades. Yeah. Um, so there's a real wealth of opportunity there. And, and I went from marine engineer technician purely because when I went through the process, they I had all the options available. And they said, oh, yeah, the Marine Engineer, you're the highest paid private in the Army. And I thought, well, I'll have a piece of that. And yeah. visions of, like, underwater engineering and all of this <laughs> cool stuff. And they said, no, no, you're working in an engine room on a, on a landing craft. But, yeah, it's the highest paid <laughs> private. Now, what I then learned is because it's the only T trade where you don't get an automatic promotion to Lance Corporal. Um, um, so we're the only reason we're the highest paid privates because we were the only T trade privates in the Army. Right. Um, <laughs> But it was a fantastic trade, you know. I, I absolutely loved it. It took two and a half years to qualify at the basic level. You know, there was a lot of learning, a lot yeah. of development. Um, and I just I loved every moment of it. Mm. Um and and I guess the other thing is I I joined the army as army as, as an apprentice. So yeah. you could join as an adult entry, which was about sort of 13, 14 weeks or so, um, mm -hmm. places like Purbright. Yeah. But for mine, it was eight months. So it was an eight months yeah. apprentice college. It was open from 16 years onwards. Mm -hmm. um, and it was brilliant because you learn all of your military skills, but there was also a real emphasis on education as well. And right. contrary to what so many people think, you can't go to war at 16. We're not child. <laughs> it's often in, sort of, in this vision. It's just a real focus on education and training. And it was just brilliant you know it was hard but mm. what I learned from it was absolutely fantastic and exactly what I needed really and what kept you there for 21 years because it's a long it's a long time so yeah I mean it's changed a bit now I believe but the pension was a big one so um yeah. 22 is the standard time frame 22 years yeah but I ended up doing 21 because I have a, I had a bit of an irregular journey through so mm -hmm. um I always had a vision that I was going to do 22 years in the army. Um, I I guess the difference for me and what led me to be where I am now mm. was I was very fortunate to meet uh, individuals who, unlike what I had at school, and maybe I just didn't listen, so I don't want to blame school, but mm. I had people that just took me to one side and said, look, have you thought about this? You know, mm. these are the options that are available to you. So... Um, I guess the first one I really remember was a promotion course. I was a corporal. Um, and on this course, you go and you talk about defence policy. You learn all about the kind of wider context in yeah. which the army operates. Um, you do debates, military writing, all sorts of different things. Wow. And I remember at the end of it, um, the instructor, who was a guy called Captain Nadir Ramesh, and he's on my LinkedIn. And I'll always be forever grateful to this guy because he pulled me to one side and said look we don't do top student he said but you know if we did we if we did you would be a, a top contender and have you thought about doing something else you know have you thought about doing some kind of additional study mm. um and I'd been flirting with the idea of doing an A-level and he just spent a real amount of time with me to really talk me through the options mm. and to show me how getting a degree could be attainable and mm. not uh, and 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 what financial support and the military has a lot of financial support that you can call on mm. um and I guess that was the difference between now you know looking at that moment and being at school yeah. I just this university because I just thought I couldn't afford it and my family couldn't afford it yeah. it was too much risk and I guess I didn't ask the right questions because I didn't know what questions to ask 
Mm. But suddenly I was being shown this option of how I could go and do a degree mm. uh, and how it could be affordable. And so that's what I did. I did a, uh, an open university degree and the open university is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, they have something called uh, USBA, which is the open university budget support. So you can pay mm -hmm. monthly. Um, and I decided I wanted to challenge myself. So I did a law degree because I figured I'm going to try and do one of the hardest degrees I could think of. Okay. Uh, <laughs> medicine wasn't going to happen part time. Right. <laughs> um, and and I guess that decision changed the course of my army career. So right. it was difficult. I was doing it alongside my job. Um, yeah. I remember one point, for example, we went to Rwanda to go and design and deliver some trade training to the Rwanda Defence Force. Yeah. And as a thank you, all of my colleagues, there's about six or seven of us that went, they went quad biking to the source of the Nile and I was writing a dissertation in the hotel room. You know, there was, oh my goodness. It was, it was a struggle to try and combine them at the time. But yeah, um, doing that degree then uh, allowed me to think about other options. And I guess this is where the second intervention that was really pivotal for me in my military career was um, two bosses I had whilst I was based out in Germany. Mm -hmm. Again, just took me to one side and said, look, we really think you're wasted as a soldier. We think right. you've got real potential and you really ought to think about applying for a commission. Right. And at the time they were talking about going to Sandhurst and there's no way I could yeah. finish my degree and do Sandhurst. Yeah. But then a little bit of exploration, I saw that um, a branch called the Education and Training Services which is the branch that delivered the training that got me, you know, encouraged me to do my degree in the first place. Mm. You could do what's called a late entry commission um, at right. Sergeant, which is what I was about to be promoted into. Um, mm -hmm. And if you go through a quite a rigorous selection process, you become what's called a late entry officer, which is you automatically become a captain. Um, yeah. You have to do various other bits and pieces. But normally late entry officer is normally people that apply for it are perhaps late 30s, their warrant officer ranks are the kind of top level right. ranks. But I was able to do it as a sergeant at 31, um, right. was accepted. Um, and yeah, so again, that's where then my career completely took a different direction. Um, as part of the, the training process for that, you do a PGCE in adult, uh, adult yeah. education. And then a master's in training design and we teach soldiers we uh become the army's training experts basically so and and just um for for people that don't know about sandhurst and the officer yeah. training could you just give a little yeah. neat thing on what that is so yeah sorry so the normal route to become an army officer is that you'll go mm. for the various selection boards and then you'll go to uh the royal military academy sandhurst Right. Um, and you'll do, I think it's just short of a year um, at Santos and you'll finish as a second lieutenant right. and you'll go okay. into whatever particular cap badge it is that you want him to join. So you'll then be a second lieutenant, you then get lieutenant, you then go to captain. A late entry is commissioned based on their experience and their knowledge right. that they've gained mm -hmm. over their time. So they go straight in as a captain. Okay. So they're the two kind of routes to becoming an army officer. But very rare that you'll get somebody who is 31 32 mm -hmm. when i started wearing it go through that late entry process it's it's quite rare at the time um i believe uh, there were a few that beat me by a couple of years but <laughs> <laughs> and um so this is you know you've got your so you did it you did your law degree yeah. Please, please tell me that you you had a nickname like Judge or something. <laughs> no, I didn't actually. Oh. Uh, people look at me a bit strange. Why I was uh, <laughs> spending all that money to do a degree and and you know sitting in my room writing essays and stuff, but uh, no, I didn't really. Um, <laughs> okay. I did have a nickname. Um, but it was Gromit, which is you know my surname is Wallace, so it was very imaginative. Uh... Very not nice. okay. Very good. But um, funny enough, one of my ex girlfriends never made the link between my surname. <laughs> and She thought it was because I looked like a dog, which <laughs> was, was charming. <laughs> Hence the former, <laughs> yeah, yeah, former yeah, girlfriend. Yeah. 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 Oh, so all right, you had your law degree and a and a nickname for about you know more cheese, Wednesday Dale, Wallace. <laughs> um, 
and then your, your PGCE, which is which entitles you to teach. Is that a conversion, isn't it? Is that right to become a teacher? Yeah, so it's, it, yeah, it's a kind of build on, sort of bolt onto your degree. Yeah, yeah, and then you've got your masters as well. Yeah. Um, and how do you feel that that kind of shaped your view on what might come next? Because you said you'd taken this unusual route. You thought you were going to do two yeah. years, and things were. No, so, squiggly is a term. It was a little bit squiggly. So where it's very squiggly. Um, but you know, I often joke. So a lot of the the uh, people that are on my PGCE course, and we'd go to Southampton University for a week at a time mm. to do. So again, it was a part time courses, but you would go and do these kind of like residentials. Um, I often joke that I had all the the negative of university and none of the fun. You know. <laughs> But in some ways that was good because it meant that I really just knuckled down on the subject and, yeah. uh, you know, unfortunately did well. And I love law. I I now realise, having done my strengths finder, why I was able to succeed in the law degree. Yeah. And it's purely because of my natural talents and I was able to lean into them. Um, mm. But I didn't know this at the time. You know, it's only that it's kind of retrospectively looking back. I think, you know... Th- they were kind of requirements as part of that professional development as an education yeah. officer. And the degree in the sorry, the master's in training design is because we the, the early part of an ETS career, uh, career, you're teaching soldiers and officers, and then you become the army's training expert. So, for example, I still do it as a reservist, and I will be involved in developing and shaping uh, military training using my sort of knowledge of what good training looks like and how to get transferred. Yeah so on and so forth um but I guess the degree thing's a really interesting one because I guess what I've also noticed and part of the reason why True North why we came about was because I think there's such a focus on degrees and it's Mm. almost become like a bit of an arms race that Mm. you know it used to be that only certain jobs required you know specialist jobs required a degree and then everybody was encouraged to go to a degree and you're almost told that unless you have a degree you're not going to get a decent job mm. and it became almost a barrier to entry yeah. and I think one of the things I've observed and I'm not knocking degrees at all here but there are so many jobs where a degree is a requirement and you kind of think well why yeah um and so many people end up with these degrees that they never use and they're saddled mm. with so much debt Mm. You know, one of the great things about the open university approach is that I was paying as I was going. So I, I was never left yeah. with anything at the end of it. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah, I think we've had this like arms race now where everybody's encouraged to get a degree and then they spend all this time and effort and money. And then actually the degree has got nothing to do with the work they end up going towards. Mm. And then, and, and again, this is something we looked at as part of our study. And then suddenly the masters became the next level now that was the differentiator how they how companies wanted to get the best talent was by yeah. those masters so then people were staying on to do that extra time to get the masters and yeah i think there's a, a, a real point here where we need to really ask ourselves what are we looking for in mm. in our in our people and i remember one of the things that really triggered true north and why we set it up was at the time two things happened. I was helping to create a charity and designing the program. And I was reminded how much I loved outdoor development and leadership Mm. and development in the outdoors, um, which is obviously part of what we do with our team building program. The second thing that was happening at the time, um, Black Lives Matter was the kind of getting a lot of, there was a lot of discussion about it on LinkedIn. Mm. And people were talking about how they were going to be less unconsciously biased when they were recruiting and reading CVs. Mm. And it initially re- resonated because I designed some hiring manager training when I was at one of my organizations and really focused on unconscious bias. Mm. But the thing that struck me was that it's really great that people are saying this, but so much talent never get to the stage where they've got a CV for you to be less unconsciously biased about. And that's mm. what I just wanted to change. And I thought, really, if you want to, what we're talking about here is talent and passion. You know, you I guess I'm an example of where you can learn the skills afterwards that you need to supplement if the role requires certain skills and knowledge. Mm-hmm. But what we want is this natural aptitude, this natural um, passion. Mm-hmm. And wouldn't it be amazing if we ha- had a way to help people who don't realise what makes them incredible 
suddenly mm. become self-aware of what they can bring and then talk about that and bring that and then yeah wouldn't it be amazing if we can find employers who are willing to look beyond the qualification and the CV and recognize that actually that talent and passion is exactly what they need in their organization. Mm. And that's why we set out to do true North. And um, one of the people we funnily enough, the post where you and I started interacting is talking to somebody uh, called Sophie, who's got a, a recruiting firm called Pollen. And that's what she's looking to do to try and really help young people sort of into mm. those placements um so yeah that was a real driver for us so like how can we try and reimagine the way in which we connect mm -hmm. talent to work and stop being so fixated on this piece of paper that actually perhaps has no relevance to the role whatsoever and as I said yeah. you know, I've got to caveat I'm not dismissing degrees they, they definitely have their place but yeah. I think they've become they've become almost like a a barrier to entry for so many people now I think and yeah. that's that's something that we really need to try and address. And it's a great point. Like you say, you can't you can't be um you can't not be unconsciously biased if your entire talent pool has already been filtered on the basis of those who went to a certain institution or have a certain qualification you, and you made me think about when I was in corporate and I was thinking how do I like I was thinking about professional development and someone said to me oh you should do an MBA and I thought oh right and then like 20 grand and I thought <laughs> um but that is a barrier within once you're in then there are yeah. barriers about who's got an MBA um so what was it like when you exited uh, military life how did you find that transition and, and how long was it before you set up true north um so I won't lie I found it really tough and I think one of the things I, I found particularly tough about learning and development is one of the things I noticed I was getting a lot of rejections because I didn't have sector specific experience right and I found it really baffling because my whole masters and the whole journey I went through is the ability to go into any organization, any part of the military and work with them to develop training. You know, yeah. we're the experts in training. They're the experts on what whatever the you know the the subject is and we work together to develop the yeah. solution. Um and I had so much experience of doing this across my yeah. time. But I was just getting these rejections and rejections and I found that really tough. Mm -hmm. Um and I remember I had a rant to a recruiter called Neil once and Neil was brilliant. And mm. um, he sort of said, right, why don't you come in for a cup of tea? And we talked about what I'd done. And, and I guess that was the next influential moment in my life was that uh, Catherine, who became my boss at Sky mm. Betting Gaming, looked beyond my sector experience and saw what I could bring from my background in the military mm. through my qualifications. Uh, and, and took that chance on me as a, a relatively unknown person who had very you know, no corporate experience. And that was a real changing point. And that's um, and that was kind of my my step into that kind of corporate world, really, then. Um, mm. So, yeah, that was tough. And I guess what I noticed, uh, not everybody, but I started to see that a lot of learning development was people that were really good at something they then train somebody to be good at something they would then book people and you know and I could see this route and not everybody again I'm not <laughs> dismissing the entire LED community <laughs> but that was certainly what my experiences were that because I hadn't worked in that environment I mm. just wasn't past the opening uh, you know past the opening interview so yeah so Catherine Boddington was just brilliant um she became my uh, my manager at Skybet and originally I went in to teach leadership and management, which obviously I had bags of experience, 20 odd years in the yeah. military, um, you know, experience across Afghanistan and all over the world doing that. Um, but again, this was before I'd done my strengths assessment, but Catherine mm. recognised my skills and my strengths. And there was a project to lead the development of safer gambling training. Mm. Um, and Skybet were really keen and leading the way in how to make gambling safer and remove the problem mm. for gambling. And, uh, and I was asked to lead this project. And again, when I look at my strengths, I can see why I was able to do that. Um, and that was incredible. It was probably one of the most rewarding, um, just one of the most ex brilliant experiences in my working 
kind of career was being given mm. that opportunity and I knew nothing about the subject mm. but I worked with experts I was introduced to a chap called Paul Buck um, who had an organization called Epic which is where I ended up working um, yeah. he had lived experience so we just worked together and we collaboratively made some really great stuff um, mm. and then my journey took me on to Epic and I became uh, ultimately their director of operations and director of performance um, and that's where, again, my skill set. So I took um, my experiences in training. We then took that into Epic and then went global, did some amazing things with loads of different um, organizations. Mm. Uh, I kept kind of growing and learning. And as I say, it was when I was leading on a project to, to create the charity, which is what we call, um, created called the Epic Restart Foundation. Mm. Um, and I looked at the program and again, all of my experiences of working with the wounded and injured sick soldiers who had been discharged, my experiences mm. with settlement, the, the task was how do we help people that have had experiences of gambling harm restart their lives? How do we yeah. build that confidence and build that self-esteem and give them those skills that they might need? And, mm. you know, there's so many parallels I could draw from all my different experiences. So it was designing that program, which is, as I say, I always knew I wanted to do leadership development in the outdoors. I always thought mm. it was going to be something I did in my kind of late 50s. Yeah. And I remember Paul, we were up in Coniston and he sort of turned to me and said, this is you, isn't it? This is what you want to be doing. Mm. And I thought, yeah, but maybe not now, but it sowed a seed and that seed developed. And, you know, one of the things I'll say about Paul is incredibly supportive and I remember knocking on his door and sort of saying, look, I've been thinking about this. I'm thinking about setting up my own business, but, you know, I'm a bit risk averse. And, mm. and I remember he said, look, I don't want to lose you, but we only have a short amount of time on this planet and I will support mm. you. You come up with some ideas and a business plan. And, you know, and and as I said, that's when the true, uh, the, the kind of this, this problem statement of how can we try and, you know, help people realise the talent that exists in this country. Yeah. Um and that's how True North Development was formed. And Katie, who I worked with, um, mm. you know, we were sort of started thrashing out ideas and we recognised that strengths was going to be so key to it because I guess what I hadn't mentioned, there were several times I had real bouts of imposter syndrome. You know, mm. in my head, I'm still this uh, numpty from a council estate in Norfolk. <laughs> you know, what am I doing here? I forget all of what I've achieved. You know, I just... Yeah see myself as this numpty from a council estate like why am I here and strengths is the bit that I keep seeing come back and go it's because of those talents that's why I'm here I'm naturally yeah. good at problem solving at, you know developing solutions and so yeah. and, you know, and the great thing as well Paul is one of the silent partners in our new business um he gave us our first contract so it just worked out brilliantly mm. um and, and that's that kind of journey that I've gone through and and now we've worked with some amazing corporates. We've done some brilliant work, um, part of our giving back stuff, working with sort of employee schemes, helping young people um, yeah. through our work at Wigan Youth Zone. So, it's, yeah, it's just been absolutely fantastic. It's been a real yeah. roller coaster journey. Not always easy. <laughs> there's, there's been certainly peaks and troughs, but it's uh, it's really rewarding, I guess. And it's it is interesting um just your point there about you know how we view ourselves and there is that tendency you know I've certainly you know I came up through a council estate and there is that self-deprecation and you make fun of yourself or you, know, you don't want to get too big for your boots um and it's madness because like you say you had a distinguished career you built your own business you've trained people you've traveled the world you've you know address some serious issues and and it's 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 funny how you you almost end up putting yourself down unnecessarily it's it's a really funny little trait I guess and I I wonder yeah. if when you have if if you have come from greater privilege you kind of don't have that I don't know I I wonder if 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 you experience any of that in your work in giving back do you see that young people are quick to sort of you know go oh yeah I know it says I'm this but actually I'm that yeah it's it's really interesting because I'm still not great at it like even when I was sort of thinking about it like 
I think I refer to myself as an expert and it makes me shudder because I feel yeah. like, like, how arrogant are you? You know, even yeah. on all these certificates and all this experience, like, I, yeah. I still shy away from it. And so many people are like, no, you must sell yourself. Like you've done incredible things, but it feels mm. really awkward. And I guess yeah. in some ways that's good because it keeps you humble. Yeah. But equally, I sometimes think that I probably miss out on opportunity because I rule myself out already because mm. of that 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 self talk. And it's it's something that I've had coaching on, and I still have to consciously work on. Mm. I think the other thing that doesn't help. Uh, one of the Gallup strengths that you might remember is achiever, and achiever yeah. love to start the day at zero, have a list, and get that list done. Yeah. And one of the blind spots about achievers that I know I'm particularly bad for is I don't stop to reflect on what I've actually done. And yeah. I just keep driving forward. Um, but it's interesting. I remember with the strengths coaching, I was coaching uh, somebody who had experienced problem gambling and they felt real shame because of their mm. experiences and what they'd done and the effect it had had on their family. And what was amazing and this has been repeated with several people now that I've coached from sort of who've experienced problem gambling is learning about their talents and knowing that these are natural to them they're there I often yeah. sort of use the analogy it's like taking a pair of mittens off and being able to see your individual fingers you always know they're there but yeah. now you've got this clarity <laughs> and for them you know they've all said it almost felt like it was permission to feel good about themselves like they yeah that because of what had happened, that they felt that they had this kind of cross to bear and they weren't allowed to do that. And this actually yeah. allowed them to feel really positive. And I, I thought that was absolutely wonderful yeah. because I guess what it does, it gives us a language that we can use mm. and it allows us to talk about ourselves. And especially if you are quite, you know, you don't like doing that, it almost gives you permission because it's not me saying it, it's my talents, they're there. You know, there's this psychometric based on five decades of research saying that I am brilliant at analytical. It's something that mm. I naturally do well. So I think that's one of the things I really like about it. It gives us this language, but um, especially with the young people, and that's one of the things I really encourage with them when we coach and we talk about it, it's this isn't something you have to go away and try and be. This is something that you're born with. The yeah. trick now is to turn it into a strength. And to yeah. do that, you have to trust it and you have to aim it and you have to use it. And, and when you do that, that's when the magic happens. And that's when excellence mm. comes. And you can see it in their face on some of the people, the young people. It's almost like, yeah, this, this, is, this is my language. Now. I can talk about this. I'm going to use this. This isn't yeah. me potentially being arrogant. This is just me saying, hey, here's all the research and this is what it says about me. So I'm going to own it. And, and that's that's great yeah it's quite um there's so much in there which I think is really powerful because um as you say I think one of the hardest people to be honest with is, is ourselves so like say if someone has an addiction you can feel shame because you have to face up to that but at, at the same time it is hard for us to acknowledge the talents that we have and say yeah. yes I am good at that um and I just love the image of the mitten I've got because like you know we I have children you have children and I know when they're little you take their mitten off and they go <laughs> I've got fingers um exactly, and then you yeah. put the mitten on and they go where are they um so I think there's so much to be um to be said I guess yeah. for that um what do you feel sort of thinking about actually the topic of ha having children and being a parent how do you use your experiences to I guess, shape ha what you share with your children about education and what might come later. I know they're a bit younger than mine, but. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a great question because there's such a danger that, I, you know, you say you must go to university. I, I think one thing that my mum always encouraged both my brother and I to do is to do something that makes us happy. Mm. Um, you know, and really when I look at my family my sort of straight line family my parents my grandparents didn't go to university um my mum's brother did and you know so that kind of side of the family went down that direction but she always just said look do something that you love mm. and I think that's the one thing I really try to encourage with my boys so they're still relatively young they're 10 and 6 yeah but um 
And what I'll always continue to try and encourage them to do is find what you're passionate about. You know, you you probably come across the um, I'm going to mispronounce it, icky guy sort of concept. Oh, um, yeah. Um, Jim Collins talks about the the kind of the, the the hedgehog. I think he talks about the, you know, what are you passionate about? What um, can you be good at? And what can you know fuel your economic engine? Mm. And I think with my boys, I just want them to find their passion. And, you know, more so with my eldest, because he's recently been diagnosed with dyslexia. And I know Mm. he doesn't he doesn't relish the academic side of things. Mm. Um, And I there's uh, I'm trying to think of her name now. She's done loads of fantastic work on um, around dyslexia and raising why it's a superpower. Uh, Julie, uh, sorry, sorry if you're listening, (laughs) the name completely escapes me. But. I really try and focus on that. Actually, you've mm. got this incredible superpower. And just because the school mm. system isn't set up at the moment to recognise mm. that, you know, you've got so much creativity, so much passion. Like, is is imagination is fantastic. Yeah. So just really channel and focus on what, what are you passionate about and what can you be great at um, mm. and really focus on that. That's, mm. I guess, and if that means going to university, great. But if it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. And by the way, you don't need to go to the university right from finishing school. Mm. You know, I, I did it when I, I started mine when I was 26. Yeah. Uh, and it worked out OK, because yeah. I found something that I was passionate about, which is solving problems. I did it as an yeah. engineer, law in some you know, in a lot of regards about serving, solving problems and what I do mm. now. That's what I love doing. So, mm. yeah, I, I guess that's what I'll always encourage my boys is to find their passion. Mm. Um as opposed to you must go to university, you must do this, you must, you know. Yeah. Um, and what do you think has held you, ask everyone this, I always get good answers on this one. What has held you okay. in good stead throughout your career? Um, oh gosh, there's lots of ways to answer this, I guess, isn't there? I think um, I've recently listened to Arnold Schwarzenegger's new book. I think it's called Be Useful. Seven Seven Rules for Life. Yes, I bought it. Yeah. It's such a great audio book because it's like, he's he's, he's brilliant. Um, But something he said that really resonated with me was having a vision. And we talk about a vision a lot. And, um, you know, in the training world, it's, it's a very common thing. But what I liked about the way he talked about vision is it doesn't need to be really clear at the beginning. So he said, you know, when he was younger, his vision was he wanted to go to America. It wasn't, I wanted to be a bodybuilder. It wasn't, I wanted to be an action hero. That all came later as he started to zoom in. He had a broad vision. And I guess I had a broad vision, which is I knew what I didn't want. Yeah. Um, and again, I'm, I'm going to sort of choose my words carefully here, but we learn from our parents and we, you know, the natural evolution is we don't want to repeat, you know, certain things that we didn't agree yeah. with. So I guess I knew what I didn't want. Um, and I've always had my values. I've um, And one of my high strengths is responsibility. And I think that's always guided me to try and do the right thing. Mm. Um, yeah. And... So I've always had that vision that I knew I wanted to leave Norfolk and Mm -hmm. then I wanted to be, you know, an excellent marine engineer. And I remember uh, our instructor uh, at the very beginning of our marine engineer training kind of called us all in and set this real challenge. Like you are marine engineers, you know, never let the trade down. You know, you always be your best and, you know, really kind of hammed it up. And that stuck with me. And mm. instilled this real sense of pride about who we are and what we did. Mm. Um, and I think that's driven me always to try to, you know, strive for excellence mm. and, you know, great things come along the way. Mm. I say that carefully because I know you'll never reach excellence, but, you know, striving for just driving, driving, and it will naturally. Yeah. And I think that's always helped me. Uh, I've always yeah. had that drive. Um so yeah, I, I, I guess that's that's probably one of my drivers. I knew what I didn't want, and I knew that I yeah. wanted to create this great life and try and make a difference. I guess. And brilliantly put, I think that likewise, knowing what you don't want is just as valid as any because that gives you something you can say, "I don't want that." Okay, if I don't want that, then 
now I can look at what I might want to have. And the, yeah. the vision thing is brilliant. I'm going to nick that book from my son. Um, yeah, I love the idea of just because I would maybe think you might look at someone who's achieved multiple things and, and gone, well, they must have gone. I want to do that, then that, then that. When in actual fact, it started with a, I want to live in America. And then these things have come. Yeah. So that's awesome. I, mean, um, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, it's funny because if someone had said to me um, five years ago or so, when I leave the army now, oh gosh, seven years ago, yeah. that you were going to end up, le you know, creating a socially driven organisation, I would have just laughed. I was risk averse. You know, I just wanted security, that classic Maslow, you know, and again, yeah. One of the reasons why university wasn't an option. Um, mm -hmm. But it's amazing the influences you have and working in Epic, which is, you know, it's just an incredible organization for what it does. I don't want to sound too sycophantic to Paul, um, <laughs> especially if he's listening, he's going to be like getting a massive big head to this. Um, and I remember saying to him, at no point did I think that's what I was going to go on and do. But then I realized I've got this, these natural skills at solving problems. And I think it was Steve Jobs that said, um, those who dream of changing the world often do, or something like that, you know. And okay. I just, I, again, I massacre quotes. You probably picked that up. <laughs> Many people listening go, you didn't. Cool. Um, but again, that notion, like dream big. And mm. yeah, so that vision is constantly evolving for me. And yeah. And in terms of um, True North, and what's kind of next in terms of that and what you want to deliver and achieve through the business and your social um, uh, value work that you do? What, what does that look like? Um, so we, we're we learning a lot <laughs> as we go through. Uh, I guess our two areas of real focus uh, going into 2024 um, are around two things. One is around helping remote teams in particular but teams come together and again one of the things I really love about strengths is it isn't just an individual report what you can then mm. do is look at teams and you start to see where those pockets of excellence are and you can see what different people bring and, and how you can really just get the best out of um, your team mm. so we're really pushing a focus on our team building product so we have uh, an outdoor uh, adventure called the strengths trail which I was doing last week mm. It's just yeah. great fun. We do loads of great stuff and we take people into a disused slate mine. Wow. Um, uh, and then we also have like an internal version again, which is all based around uh, strengths, which is a sort of one day in a classroom. It's like an escape room in a, in a classroom. Yeah. It's really exciting, but really, you know, great feedback on that. So we're really kind of talking about that and how it can really help high performing teams come together mm. because, we're going to be sharing a lot of um, sort of content over the next couple of months, but we believe that so many team builds miss so many of the vital ingredients, you know, mm. often it's a, let's go out bowling and then we're all going to go to the pub and you know, they're mm. great, but they miss so many in really yeah. important to what brings a high performing team together. Uh, and the other area really is continuing our real focus on our social mobility side of things. So yeah. Um, we never thought that this was going to be a thing. You know, our model was that when people buy our training for their organization, that we would then go and do some work with either a charity of their choice or charities that we're sort of connected with. Mm -hmm. But one of our clients at the end of last year said, look, you know, we, we don't have an internal training need at the moment with, you know, the stuff you've done with us is great, but we really want to continue supporting Wigan Youth Zone. And it was um, NRB accountants. And they said, look, can we pay would you be willing yeah. to go do coaching if we paid for it? And we're like, well, Amazing. yeah, of course. So um, that's an area we're really looking into. How do we try and do that? How do we help organizations who could be connected with some really fantastic charities, but how can we help them through their CSR efforts really make meaningful change in that CSR space, you know, really mm. have those tangible uh, outcomes where they can see the impact of what they're, you know, CSR's done. So yeah. they're the two kind of areas, I guess. So it's how do we help teams come together in this kind of new, crazy remote world that we live in? And yeah. how do we help make meaningful change and encourage social mobility? So there are Love two it. areas of focus. So. Awesome. Um, I will put links to where people can find you in the show yeah. notes. 
Um, so I suppose all that's left to say is thank you ever so much for joining me on the podcast, Pete. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. I, I feel like I've talked a lot. <laughs> um, it's been brilliant. Thank you.